Hello and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Philip Campbell and I have the privilege to be chairing this session on prioritizing workplace mental health. Um, I'm very grateful that the World Economic Forum is allowing us to have this discussion. Um, it has over several years been championing mental health as a theme and um, it has recently held both public and internal events about uh, mental health in the workplace. My own company, uh, Springer Nature, of which um, I'm the editor-in-chief, is a research publishing company, and uh, it too has gone on its journey. Uh, its current size is about 13,000 employees, and over the years it has graduated, if you like, from looking after the individual interests of people with mental health issues into a more company-level approach including uh, quite recently a, a very intensive survey of people where people were able to express their free text views as well as respond to surveys. And also a network of champions were set up in the company, uh, mental health champions. So that sort of trajectory is something that many companies are following. And if you Google uh, on workplace mental health, you'll find many big companies have their initiatives. Um, but there is a question about what the bigger perspective of all of that looks like. What are the agendas that we should be thinking of at a high level in order to make progress on that? COVID, of course, also has given extra urgency to the challenge uh, because I'm sure it doesn't need to be said how much stress and anxiety that has given rise to on top of whatever else may be going on in companies that give rise to mental health issues, or that just need to deal with those of the of colleagues. So let me introduce the panel. It's a very distinguished panel with people with very strong track records of interest. Uh, Miranda Wolpert um, is head of the mental health priority area at the Wellcome Trust. That's a 200 million pound program at the Trust, uh, which is based in London. She's a clinical psychologist by background, very much focused on evidence-based approaches towards prevention and treatment for anxiety and depression in young people. Her program includes an initiative on mental health in the workplace. Puneet Renyan is Global Chief Executive Officer of Deloitte and a member of the International Business Council. A look at his tweets highlights his strong championship of workplace mental health, backed up by a recent Deloitte Global Millennial Survey where nearly 20,000 people, young people, in 43 countries were surveyed about aspects of mental health and well-being. So I'm sure we'll be hearing about that. Garen Staglin is a private equity and venture capital investor, an owner of the, the owner or the co-owner of the Staglin family vineyards in Napa Valley, and a long-standing philanthropist and fundraiser in the cause of mental health. He speaks here in his role of co-founder and chairman of One Mind, a, a, a leading US-based fundraising and funding organization in mental health. And it has its own initiative on workplace mental health involving 90 companies. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you all. And uh, I'm gonna turn over to each of them. And then I hope towards the end, we'll have time to um, have some general discussion. So, Miranda, over to you. Do tell us about your initiatives in this area. Thank you. And uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here. And when we were in Davos last year, uh, mental health and the workplace were just starting to take off. And one of the exciting things, despite these incredibly challenging times, is how much that agenda has grown and developed and how much workplaces are rising to the challenge of saying this is something we really need to address. And in that way, I think the pandemic has actually provided an opportunity to rethink and think afresh about what it means to support mental health in the workplace. So welcome, as um, Phil very kindly said, I used to head up the, the priority area. In fact, as of the 1st of January, I am now Director of Mental Health at Welcome, which is a larger agenda, which includes both anxiety and depression in younger people, but will also include wider mental health issues. And the workplace we increasingly see is a key uh, site where we can promote good mental health science and really learn what works for who and why. Over this last year, we put out a call to the research community to say, tell us your best ideas of what will really make a difference in the workplace and review the evidence for them. 
we're aware that those who are running global workplaces are constantly being barraged by all sorts of uh, companies saying, use this intervention or that intervention. This is the way forward to workplace, workplace well-being or mental health. And there's very little evidence base for many of them. So out of all the proposals that came in, we funded 10. And of those 10, um, that many interesting ideas emerged. So for example, we found that a group that looked at the issue of excessive sitting in, uh, in during the day, if you can break up excessive sitting by light activity of just one hour um, in an eight hour day, it can reduce depressive symptoms by 10% and anxiety symptoms by 15%. So a simple, effective intervention that people can think about in the workplace. Another group looked at the issue of autonomy in role and found that having more autonomy in role can have a positive impact on both anxiety and depression. But the data suggested the autonomy may actually be a less troubling issue for the younger workers compared with older workers, although still an issue for many, and that it may also interact with personality traits of those who want autonomy and those who are less troubled for it. But a significant factor was how far it was supported within the organization and can be supported within role descriptions. Flexible working was another area looked at by our researchers, and they found that flexible working can help reduce work-home conflict, which can be a major source of stress, depression, and anxiety, but uptake of flexible working is strongly affected by support from supervisors and line managers. And finally, we had a group, uh, not finally of the groups, but of the ones I'm going to give examples of today. There was a group that looked at the issue of mindfulness in low and middle income uh, context, particularly looking at uh, the tourism in industry in Jamaica, for example, and found that whilst there's a lot of evidence for the use of mindfulness to address anxiety and depression in high income contexts, there's much less use, uh, evidence in low and middle income contexts. So going forward this year in May, we'll have a second commission on the same lines, inviting people to uh, review the evidence for what they think are the best bets for interventions in the workplace. And we're really interested to hear from any of you on this call about ideas that you think you're using in your workplace that may be worth our researchers looking at. And secondly, we're then looking longer term to try and find partnerships with workplaces to embed rigorous scientific research in the workplace to actually test what works so that workplaces have become evidence-informed places where mental health can thrive. So look forward to hearing other people's views and look forward to further discussion. Thank you very much, Miranda. Let me just follow up with one question. A lot of people listening might be interested in just what it means to have researchers embedded in their companies. And of course, there are issues of confidentiality and so on. So um, perhaps you could give a sense, given that you've been doing these overviews of how this work has been going, of what those have looked like and what these, what your listeners, the people you're encouraging, should expect. So I would say we are at the absolute early stages of thinking of workplaces as places for rigorous research to be done. So one of the main findings from almost all the review teams was the sheer paucity of research, particularly for younger workers. And uh, most of it was based on sort of anecdotal, very, very small studies. We recognize it's a big burden for workplaces to be involved in um, scientific study, but we also think there are ways of doing this that can minimize that burden and find ways where they can learn new things. I think we need to move from a position where we are now, where workplaces are asking, just tell us the evidence and we'll do it. Where we have to be honest is we don't know the evidence for most things. We need to work with you to find that evidence. We will try and do that in a completely non-burdensome way, but simply sitting back and expecting the evidence to come to you may not be in your or your workers' best interests. So we really encourage you, particularly those that are running in many countries, to think about whether you might partner. We will help take the pain out. We will translate for you from the researchers who talk research speak to business speak and think about how this can be really effective for you in your workplace. Thank you very much, Miranda. Puneet, please do tell us about your interests in this. Well, I, I particularly enjoyed uh, Miranda's comments uh, around evidence-based uh, research, and that is something that we certainly need to focus on. But you started off quoting the uh, Deloitte Global Millennial Survey, and this year we focused on mental health. And there were some uh, very interesting and stark data points that came out of that survey. 48% of Gen Zs and 44% of millennials said that they felt stressed or anxious all or most of the time. That was nearly half of the 20,000 that was surveyed. And they said that they ranked it as their number one or number prior, number one or number two issue. 
um, 80 percent of the 300,000 individuals that comprise Deloitte, 300,000 professionals, are Gen Z and millennial. So this is a really big issue for a firm like ours. Um, you know, another data point, $1 trillion, according to the WHO, is lost every year uh, because of mental health issues. So it is imperative uh, for Deloitte to take, uh, take uh, action, to focus on it. And we are focused on it uh, in three ways. One, uh, to create a mental health baseline for every country where we operate. We operate in about 100 plus countries, so a baseline. Um, launched uh, well-being check-ins, launched education. And then what we're doing at Deloitte is partnering with others, other entities like Deloitte, uh, to form a global business collaboration for workplace mental health. And um, entities like BHP, Unilever, HSBC, Salesforce, and Clifford Chance. And the intent is to take the stigma out of this, to, uh, to cooperate, collaborate, learn from each other, and, um, and really put this on, on the front burner because this is the time to act. Thank you very much. I mean, a notable thing about your discussion is that you are the CEO. And uh, I, I think if there's one thing that really matters in businesses is championship from the very top, that this isn't just seen as an issue for the HR department. And I, you might want to, given your conversations you've had with other companies, you might want to enlarge on that. But another, another question is about the scale of the companies. You're talking about very large companies, and yet these issues are also, no doubt, uh, really important in companies of any size. And I'd be glad to hear how you see the scale of the companies uh, in, in your mind's eye for the future in, in this initiative. Well, there are multiple questions in that uh, in that in in what you just said. Uh, let me start with um, with this notion. That this this is just an issue for large companies. That is absolutely not the case. Um, we are starting with six well-known companies, certainly, uh, but our intent is to invite uh, companies of all sizes, all across the world, uh, to uh, to participate. And as I said, the intent is to raise the profile of the issue. Uh, to collaborate, to learn from each other, to learn from entities like uh, Miranda's and others, and to build a common uh, set of best practices that we can implement in, in our companies. Uh, HSBC, Unilever that have been focused on this, like Deloitte for, uh, for quite some time, have some best practices um, that uh, we're going to certainly leverage. So it is focused on both large and small companies. Your, your question about uh, the CEO issue, go back to uh, the, the point that I started with. If half my workforce, 80% uh, of my workforce, believes that this is a number one or number two issue, it's certainly a very critical issue for me as a CEO. I know that uh, retention of individuals, Deloitte is only successful by hiring and retaining the very best individuals. So retention becomes a very big issue as well. So this is a top CEO issue for me uh, to, to, uh, to address and, uh, and address all elements of it. Miranda talked about work-life balance. Work-life balance certainly in an entity like Deloitte is a very big issue and something that the CEO and the senior leadership team can actually address to create a culture uh, where individuals believe that they can have some semblance of balance between work and life, particularly in this uh, environment that we operate in today with the pandemic where there's a real blurring between work and, uh, and uh, home life. And that is something that we are also very focused on. Thank you very much, Puneet. Garen, uh, you t do tell us about the One Mind initiatives uh, that are engaged with those 90 companies that I mentioned. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the World Economic Forum, as you say, for highlighting this very important topic. And Miranda and Puneet, I'm honored to be on this panel with you. Uh, I, let me begin by sort of that same reminiscing that Miranda did. I can remember a sunny day in Davos last year uh, where we start and began these conversations. And lo and behold, COVID happened. Uh, if there's anything good about COVID, it has reshaped and I believe accelerated the priority for mental health, uh, not only among corporations, but governments around the world. This is important to me because this topic is very personal to me. 
I think many of you who don't know me uh, would know that 31 years ago, my son Brandon had a psychotic break, and that caused us to start running towards the problem. Uh, and we've been doing that ever since, uh, working on science and accelerating it, services, but more recently in society. Five years ago, uh, we launched One Mind at Work with the effort to really try to understand that if you're going to impact discrimination and stigma, the best place to do it is the workplace, because we used to say you spend 70% of your waking hours at work. And now you spend 100% of your time at work because work and home are the same thing. So it's even more important. Um, our five-year anniversary is coming up. We now have over 90 employers and partners covering almost 8 million employees from Singapore to Geneva and soon Beijing working under this charter of principles. I think it's clear now everybody understands it's the right thing to do, but I think we're now proving that it's also good for business. And Pune, to your point, it's impossible to build a global force today that excludes people with mental health needs. And I think the understanding that we're all on a spectrum of brain health now, and that spectrum is likely lower for all of us given COVID, the racial tensions that exist, political divisiveness and economic uncertainty. Um, so I'm gonna talk very briefly about the responses that we're seeing from our employers or what are their four top priorities, what are they're doing about it and why this has built a call to action to recognize a new term for many of you, which is neurodiversity. And we believe that neurodiversity must be a pillar alongside your DNI programs, along with gender, racial, and sexual orientation. So to this point about uh, what are the responses that are happening as a result of COVID, let me go through four uh, that I think are important. First, it's important that we there's increased awareness about mental health needs and not just the condition themselves. You must normalize the idea that it's okay not to be okay. Uh, and everyone needs to have an option to improve their own mental health or brain fitness. This idea of brain health and brain fitness, I think allows people to focus on the positive side of this issue as opposed to the negative. Second, a culture of connection needs to be established. We now in this work from home environment have to look at closely at ways to connect and collaborate different than how we would do on just a, a Zoom call. Uh, third, new tools and resources are being developed. We all know about telepsychiatric services, which are now not only growing more prevalent, but also being reimbursed. We have guides to digital health on apps to take advantage of neuroplasticity and interventions that Miranda is leading in this effort by the Wellcome Trust are certainly going to lead us to new ways uh, to bring this together. Uh, and finally, uh, to Puni's point and to others, it needs to be a strong and consistent message from leadership. Uh, our charter requires a C-suite signature, uh, and it is really important if you're going to change culture, you must do so on a broad and global scale. And empathy versus autocratic, I think, is the new leadership style. So these three, these factors plus others come back to my point. I believe it's now a mandate for recognizing neurodiversity as an equal priority. Uh, so what does that net term mean? Uh, there's a, each of you may have your own definition, but I would like to suggest it's the difference in how we all receive, interpret, process, and express information. It influences how each of us responds to communication with colleagues, our ability to deal with change, our ability to deal with stress and our approach to problem solving. So given that definition, how can we all support neurodiversity in your own workplace? Well, first I would say we must remove barriers to entry and advancement. Targeting recruitment of underutilized groups such as autism, veterans with post-traumatic stress and others is an important way to go forward. Fostering a culture of inclusion is another one understanding we're all on this spectrum of brain health. We all need to not only be open about our condition, but also seek help to do so. And finally, e emphasizing flexibility and customization of how each individual needs to be treated. One size does not fit all when it comes to this issue. So I hope this has been helpful and piqued your interest uh, enthusiasm to support neurodiversity. I would invite you to join a virtual working group that we are putting together to explore and develop 
neurodiversity metrics and narratives, ultimately for ESG reporting, which well, but not only the International Business Council, uh, as well as the World Economic Forum have just produced new guidelines. Um, this working group, in addition to be chaired by ourselves, will be chaired by Marnaud Chappelle, uh, is supported by the World Economic Forum, and we have a number of confirmed participants, uh, and we would invite many of more of you to join. If you'd like to participate, please let me know, uh, or my colleague Katie Riddick at info at onemind.org. This will be in the second quarter. We'll be happy to share a, pa a paper we've done on neurodiversity. So uh, again, I'm passionate about this and persistent, and I think the time is exactly right for us to pursue neurodiversity as an integral pillar of diversity and inclusion across all employers. Karen, thank you so much. Um, I, I think you've got some slides which you're going to post after the session. Um, yes, that I do. Presumably, that, that presumably has con contact details for those people who are interested. And I'm hoping also that the other two speakers who might want people to contact them can uh, find a mechanism with the World Economic Forum to help that. Um, I, want to, I do want to talk to uh, uh, both Puneet and, and Garen about communications in companies. And I mean, this is something that may be worth studying if it isn't already being studied by uh, Miranda's initiative. But, um, uh, you know, communication, it sounds so easy to talk about, but there comes a point, especially when a company is at the very top level struggling in a time of what we're in at the moment to meet its financial objectives. And it can't always be open about how that's going uh, internally or externally. And yet at the same time, if employees are not in the picture about that, that can lead to attention. I don't know whether that's reflected in your, your experience and your views of the company, but I guess the question I'm asking of both Puneet and Garen is, where is that a problem? Where, where do you need to be most thoughtful about that? Or where, do, where is that a problem, a challenge in terms of communication, uh, particularly in the current era? So Puneet, let me ask you that first. First off, communicating is in incredibly important and certainly uh, starting with the CEO uh, to destigmatize uh, de the issue. Um, again, going back to the data that I cited, it is, a, it is not only the right thing to do, it is the right business thing to do. And so we have um, communicated in terms of the issue, whether it is work-life balance or inclusion, and uh, tried to um, uh, destigmatize it. I've also uh, tried to communicate the leadership buy-in, that this is not just a CEO issue, but the entire leadership team is behind this um, and, uh, and view this as, uh, in this environment particularly, the right thing to do and the right business thing to do. So we, we certainly have taken this as a, as a really important issue and are very consistently communicating uh, across our, uh, our, our, our organization. And is COVID putting, giving you extra, extra dynamics in that, if you like? Is it giving you um, extra challenges that because you're meeting them are going to help you in the future? Absolutely. I mean, COVID is uh, certainly very challenging on multiple dimensions. The fact that you can't actually meet with somebody, interact with somebody, provide mentorship and apprenticeship uh, complicates it. Uh, you can't address all of these issues through Zoom. I think that's why... Uh, communication, uh, destigmatizing the issue, providing the tools and techniques um, uh, that are available to our professionals uh, takes on uh, added uh, importance. Right. And Karen, do you want to comment on this? Sure. Um, I would echo Booney's comments. I mean, it's really important that they hear from the leadership uh, that that their own personal experience and their own uh, activities and engagement on this topic are equal to theirs. Uh, we like to say that everybody has somebody and that if you think of the illnesses from early autism, learning disorders, uh, eating disorders, on through my son's illness and late life illness. So there isn't anybody that doesn't have a friend, a family member, a neighbor, a workmate, or potentially themselves with issues along the spectrum. And to the extent that you can do a fireside chat. I've done these with Brian Monahan at Bank of America, with uh, Tim Arnold at the Capital Group of the CEOs of Merck, NASDAQ, and others, where we, to their entire employee base, I talk about my own condition, our family condition. And once you have this openness, 
about the fact that it's personal to everyone. There's a cathartic effect where the barriers to talking about it drop, people come forward, and you constantly hear, you know, I've never told anybody, but, you know, I come to work every day worrying that my daughter with eating disorders won't be there when I come home. And these personal stories propel the momentum forward to uh, eliminate the discrimination that people might feel from accessing. So it's absolutely critical and it needs to be consistent. Yeah. Um, Miranda, uh, Garam in his talk was talking about the new technologies and tools that are available. Um, and I, I don't know to what extent those make a difference in the business content over and above the way in which they're helping everyone in psychiatry and uh, dealing with mental health, the digital telehealth, et cetera. So I'm interested to know whether there is a particular angle of those within the company context that is of interest to you. And, and related but different is the issue of social media and how they can be both positive and negative in these circumstances. And that too may be something that you're looking at. So um, I'm, I'm just inviting you to comment on at least those two issues. You're on mute, I think. Uh, yeah, I have the privilege of being part of a Lancet Financial Times Commission chaired by Elena Kirkbush and others around looking at the issue of digital technology and health more generally for the coming generation. Um, and so there's some very interesting cross-sections, as you say, around uh, digital both as an enhancer and a radical opportunity to roll things out at scale to large numbers of people across the world. And then real concerns about how um, some access to social media may actually be harmful or, or if unmediated, may be difficult. Um, I think the jury's out on both aspects. There's certainly opportunities here and there are things to be concerned about. I suppose the main message I would want people to take from today is that we don't yet know so much about what really helps. And I think there's a real danger that workplaces in a well-meaning way think this is the way to do it and and you know whether it's people talking to each other or not talking to each other there, there is so much yet for us to learn about what helps different people and we have to take the rigorous approach we take to other interventions to mental health in the workplace so one of the things we've been discussing with colleagues today is the fact that for physical health there's almost an assumption that an ex expert will know better than you and there's almost a too much assumption that experts should know and that you don't know yourself. Whereas with mental health, it's almost the other way around. There's an assumption that we all know intuitively. It's just a question of doing it. But actually, there's so much for us to learn from the science about actually what will make a difference for different groups of workers in different contexts. And it may not, some of it may be talking, some of it may be training, but there may be other interventions, some of which can be digitally mediated, some of which has to do with physical Activity, some of which is due with sleep, some of which is due with workplace uh, packages and pay and working conditions. So we need to think of health, uh, mental health as bigger than healthcare and the opportunity for the workplace to trial different ways of helping mental health that don't focus purely on psychological interventions is something we're particularly interested in. Can I just so, add to what please Miranda do. just please. said? I think the point that she's making in is, is an excellent point, uh, which is uh, there's so much more to learn. And that's why we formed this global business collaboration. I mean, these are six world-class entities, and we are suggesting that we can learn from each other. We can learn from Garen and from Miranda. And we want to share this in a transparent way because there's so much that we don't fully understand. Uh, and I think this is a really important point. And the, the, the reason why we formed this collaboration uh, to, to get these six firms together, uh, put our uh, experience, uh, and then be able to share it with everybody. So um, yeah. I'm probably going to give Garen the last minute, the, the last word, given that we're running out of time. But let me just ask you your point of view on that. Having worked with 90 companies, clearly people are yes. doing things. So over to you just I for the last minute. I, I would uh, echo that exactly because listen, when you, uh, where all companies, all employers are on a journey of, of where best practices and where it is right for them. And the thing that you can't afford to do is pay this, a tuition fee twice. So why not learn from others? You develop the aha ideas. Uh, and that is the, our, our coalition is really a network. And the power of that network is the sharing 
uh, and the working together to get to these ideas. So we absolutely welcome that collaboration and learning. I would just say one thing quickly uh, to Miranda's point uh, and, and to emphasize Prunitz, Gen Z and millennials do not, there are many of them will not take a pill. They don't want a pill as an answer to their health conditions. So neuroplasticity and positive feedback loop apps have actually proven well to others. Meditation, mindfulness, yoga, exercise, these are all elements of a therapy for people that we need to continue to explore. And as Miranda says, there's so much more we don't know than we do. We have to keep trying a lot of stuff and keep what works. I think that's a very good point on which to end. Uh, we have three people here who obviously now are in contact, even if in some cases they weren't before. And it, the, the working together of research and companies and learning from each other's experience is the key message. So uh, the, above all, the key message is that the World Economic Forum can, I hope, help everyone who's listening to this contact whoever they want on the panel to help things to happen. Uh, in their own context. So thank you, all of you speakers. Thank you, Garen, Puneet, and Miranda. Thank you to the World Economic Forum, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. <laughs>